Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. I'm scientist, alchemist, engineer, and quack, Inane Dragon. And tonight we'll be adding homeopath to that list of titles, which I think we're going to find is just another sort of a quack, but a very special sort of a quack. What the fuck is homeopathy? Well, to answer that question, we have to go back in time 200 years to when medicine meant leeches and doctors had an awful lot in common with barbers. Ooh, look! A script! Homeopathy got its start with a man named Christian Frederick Samuel Hanneman, which is a name I would never remember without a script, at the turn of the 19th century. He was trained as a classical physician in the standard of his day. That is, he was taught all about the four humors of classical Greek training, sometimes called heroic medicine. Hanneman eventually rejected this training as worse than non-treatment. I might add that on this point, he was fucking right. We're talking about in medical practices involving significant bloodletting inducing vomiting, even making your patient have the shits, all in the name of balancing out between the four humors. That'll be its own video. You know how that shtick goes. Oh, occasionally a folk or herbal remedy was allowed a foot in the door, but by and large, the medicine that Hanneman grew up with was both ineffective and dangerous to everyone involved. What we now know as modern medicine got it started about the same time as scientific ideas infiltrated hospitals and doctors' personal practices. However, these movements began after Hanneman had already taken the principled position of abandoning his medical practice. Credit where it's due. Hanneman not only saw this problem with what he did for a living, he embraced his principles and risked poverty for not only himself, but his young family. Still got that script. To make ends meet, Hanneman took up translating medical texts. William Cullen's Materia Medica detailed the use of cinchona bark to treat malaria as a tonic. I won't pretend to understand Cullen's explanation, but Hanneman believed that I need to reread my script. <clears throat> Still got my script. To make ends meet, Hanneman took up translating medical texts, one of which was William Cullen's Materia Medica, in which he detailed using a tonic of cinchona bark to treat malaria. I won't pretend to understand Cullen's explanation, but Hanneman believed that he did understand and that Cullen was wrong in his hypothesis. So Hanneman took to investigating the method of action for cinchona bark and proceeded to consume it in large quantities. After taking cinchona bark, he believed that he saw in himself the common symptoms of malaria. To test this out, he proceeded to use additional so-called remedies on himself or his loved ones in overdose quantities. He called this provings because they were supposed to prove that the remedy in a healthy person caused the same symptoms as the disease did in a sick person. And using this tactic, he gave a veneer of scientific credibility to his otherwise ridiculous activities. Over the years, he concluded that the relationship he first saw with Cinchona Bark held true in enough of his provings as to declare that he had discovered a new universal law, which we shall call the first rule of homeopathy. You don't talk about- wait, wait, I'm getting word that this joke is overplayed. Right then. The first rule of homeopathy is the idea that like cures like. Meaning that if something causes a symptom in a healthy person, it'll cure that symptom in sick people. So, if you've got a rash, then you need poison ivy to cure it! As an aside, we now know that cinchona bark is an effective treatment for malaria because it contains quinine, which appears to inhibit the metabolism of hemoglobin by the parasite which causes malaria. 
completely unrelated to Hanneman's Like Cures Like rule. Classically administered as a tonic, the bitter taste of Cinchona Bark led to serving the tonic alongside a soldier's ration of gin in the British Raj, and so mixology history was made. Hanneman published this Like Cures Like rule along with a number of his provings and other thoughts on the subject in the first edition of what would become the central text of homeopathy, The Organum. The first publication was in 1810, and he returned to regular practice to expand his knowledge of this new medicine and ultimately composed six editions of the Organon. To this day, the Organon remains the sacred text of homeopathy, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. Imagine any doctor turning to Plato for medicine. Since many of Hanneman's treatments are potentially lethal, we're talking arsenic and hemlock for just two examples here. While others have significant side effects, Hanneman began diluting his remedies significantly. During the course of his lifetime, he reached the point of a 1 to 100 ratio dilution repeated 30 times in succession. This led to his cure at 30 potencies, as he'd call it, and later homeopaths would take this to the extreme of 100,000 serial dilutions, claiming each time that the dilution increased the potency. Once again, Hanneman saw what he wanted to see, believing that as he decreased concentrations, something more miraculous than a loss of side effects happened. Cures seemed to occur more rapidly and more often as Hanneman reduced the concentration of actual active ingredient. And from this comes our second rule of homeopathy. Dilution is the solution to pseudoscience. The more dilute a cure is, the more powerful it is. Hanneman began calling the number of times a remedy had been diluted its potency. Somewhere along the line, possibly in realization that it makes no sense for an infinitesimally diluted remedy to actually remedy what ails you, Hanneman introduced the idea of succession as our third rule of homeopathy. If it violates the known laws of science, beat it! Homeopathy preaches that you have to vigorously shake the mixture rather than stirring or gently shaking it. This is called succession, and it is claimed that such shaking potentizes the mixture by imprinting the curative agent onto the water's memory. Because water has memory, and it selectively remembers the cure rather than any of the shit quite literally that has ever been in it, or the glass within which it's contained while you're shaking it. Of course, while all of this was a vast improvement over the heroic medicines of his contemporaries, these have all just been assumptions on Hanneman's part. He never performed rigorous experimentation outside of his so-called provings, and appears to have been susceptible to a substantial amount of confirmation bias. Which all just means that the odds are high that he still had something that was no better than a sugar pill, or not getting treated at all. So Hanneman began concocting his most complicated addendum to his story of disease, the concept of a miasm. In short, Hanneman concluded that chronic or resistant diseases were the result of what he would call miasms, and that these could be caused by noxious vapors, spirits, spiritual failings like sin, or your heredity. Parts of this idea are in line with what we now call the germ theory of disease and congenital disorders before either concept was really developed in science. It also resulted in Hanneman instituting better cleanliness and patient segregation protocols during disease outbreaks. Moreover, he encouraged healthy lifestyles to prevent the development of miasms, all of which would have been cool, except for one minor problem. Two, even. First and worst, Hanneman blamed heroic medicine as a third contributing factor with miasms. He and his disciples extended this accusation to the emerging field of modern medicine. For Hanneman to prevent the development of disease and miasms, the only safe solution was homeopathic treatment without deviation, without modification, without supplementation. And second, Hanneman proposed a very limited number of miasms with which we could blame a wide swath of diseases. Because classical homeopathy doesn't even believe in disease, only in symptoms. 
The miasm of Sora, for example, was responsible for what traditional medicine calls gout. But it's also to blame for cancer, epilepsy, and asthma. All from the same thing, therefore they would all be treated the same way. And that's just a short list of what Sora can cause. This completely undercut any potential homeopathy had to get us to the germ theory, to get us to the concept of congenital ailments. So this leads to our fourth and final rule of homeopathy. If a homeopathic treatment fails, it's not the homeopath's fault. And it's interesting to note that in spite of the get-out-of-jail-free card this gives them, most homeopaths either abandon this concept entirely or modify it heavily for their own use. In summary, if you think something is likely to kill you and you're curing death, then repeatedly dilute that substance until there's nothing left while shaking it vigorously. And if the patient isn't a zombie after administering, it's something supernatural evil's fault. Let us say that you have an unfortunate suffering from slurred speech, loss of coordination, confusion, irritability, nausea, and a tendency to run a YouTube channel. If we look through our various Materia Medica, we'll see there's no single treatment for all of these symptoms. And in general homeopathic care, well, you gotta use a single remedy at a time. So, let's consider doing a proving. Now, from past experience, I have seen booze cause all of these symptoms. We can, therefore, conclude that a Formal proving of booze as a cure-all is necessary. We just have to get someone to test it for us. Wait, we just saw it? Oh, okay. Moving on. Now that we've seen through our proving how effective alcohol is in curing YouTube content creation, we're going to have to make a homeopathic remedy. We have our Kraken 94 proof spiced rum. Chosen in part for its color, in part for its ability to inebriate us. And we're diluting it into distilled water. As you do when you are a quack. We're going to have one part rum to 99 parts water, and we're going to do this repeatedly until I either run out of water or patience. Without further ado... Here we have an air bubble being a dick. Science, ladies and gentlemen.
my dear viewer, is one of the most common over-the-counter dilutions that you will be sold. This, a 12C potency, meaning that it's been diluted at a 1 to 100 ratio 12 times. So if our calculations are correct, this will cure me of YouTubeism. So how the hell is all this supposed to work? Well, in the 1800s, they at least had the excuse of not knowing much about chemistry and physics the way we do today. The idea of something more than the natural world was also far more plausible. So the idea developed that a spiritual essence of a medication imprinted onto the memory of the water. In reality, by the time you finish diluting your remedy, you'd be lucky to have a molecule of the actual active ingredient in any volume of water smaller than a sphere more than seven light minutes in diameter. That's right, a sphere that could touch the sun on one side and the earth on the other. With at best, a molecule of your liquor left over. What you're seeing on screen is a set of ammonia tests. Using an over-the-counter aquarium test kit and store brand ammonia concentrate for cleaning, as you can see, we go from railing the test kit out at the extreme end of its range to so dilute that it's safe for your fish after just four dilutions. And this shit's supposed to cure what ails you? Please. Tell me you're not so foolish. That's it for homeopathy, my friends. What started as a hope to improve bad medical practices devolved into a cult of personality around Mr. Hanneman and lingers on today as an alternative to reality for those who want an easy, painless answer to all of their problems. If you've enjoyed this inanity, please consider subscribing for more of the same. Do that whole rating, commenting, sharing thing as you see fit. And if you are truly a name, consider supporting me on Patreon, such as the likes of Yakru and a Moldy Donut, as well as several others. Links to all of that down below in the description. Thank you all, and have a good night, because I have a script.